My guest Antonio shared a quote in our conversation in this episode that really hit me. The next 10 years will disproportionately affect the next 100 years. So we have to be really conscientious of what we do with that time. I think that's so right and the appropriate sentiment for spring of 2020. We're in the middle of what may be a brand new era. We're at an inflection point. We're at the precipice. How do we take our organizations through this? How do we get through change and not lose our soul or our community? Those are the things I was inspired about with this conversation. Let's get started. Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast from Birkin Law about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. Hey, uh, my name is Antonio Cardona. I've been a nonprofit guy for a very long time, almost 20 years uh, in this sector. Right now for my day job, I really spend a lot of my time overseeing 20 charter schools in the Twin Cities and then also managing some other programs. Right on. So I was actually trying to explain what the hell managing charter schools is as an authorizer. And I think that I really screwed up my elevator speech on your behalf to the person I was telling. So I would love it if you could give a little, you know, what does that look like? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think first uh, with charter schools, the way that I look at it is, you know, they're public schools that have a higher level of local control, you know, a better ability to be nimble, try innovative things uh, because they don't have a larger system that has to agree with letting them do that. And so, you know, with some of the work that we do um, uh, at Pillsbury United Communities where I work is largely rooted in, you know, bringing higher levels of local control to communities. Yep. And then from an authorizer perspective, you know, we kind of stand between the school and the Department of Education and provide, you know, oversight around finances, academic achievement, governance, you know, and have solid operations. Which is sort of the, you know, meta theory that the nonprofit sector can often do a better job of those things mm-hmm. for the government. So mm-hmm. it's, you're kind of both a buffer and a supervisor totally. agency. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. And I know that um, I was checking you out before the show, snooping on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> I saw. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I had to connect to you first, otherwise it'd be creepy. Um, But I saw that you guys also, you authorize or sponsor innovative groups and maybe immigration groups. And Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about that, too. So, you know, Pillsbury, where I work, you know, this is our 140th year. uh, And so very much rooted in the Settlement House movement, this idea that you live in the communities that you serve uh, and really partner with, you know, those folks. And so uh, we have community centers all around Minneapolis. And so it's really rooted in bedrock services of, you know, employment programs, food programs. But we've really, I think, in the last number of years, taken it to a different level where we've started to play with a lot of other ideas. So we've built out some pretty large social enterprises, some medium-sized and small ones. And, you know, some of the smaller ones are, you know, youth-led social enterprises that have come about. And so, you know, our thinking is, you know, as we progress into the 21st century, the work has to look very different. Power sharing just has to look very different from not not just the perspective of how do you engage people on the front end, but how do you also operationalize that? That's super interesting, you know, especially coming from such a large and established, you know, long time, 140 years organization to take such an innovative approach. It feels like the sector in general tends to be very conservative and very like, oh, we don't want to take a risk because, you know, that might increase our overhead or might mess up our funding streams. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, it's interesting. interesting. You know, I think as we've thought about what we would kind of consider, I think, our sister agencies, you know, a lot of them over time have slowly gone out of business. And a lot of that is because they really haven't done the hard work to change their model or kind of reassess. And I think our, you know, the fortunate place that we've been in is, the ability to have a high level of risk tolerance has actually attracted a lot of resources for us. I mean, just even on my tiny little scale here as a private practice attorney, like, I get that, right? Like, the legal industry is completely behind, and I'm Mm. seen as this complete weirdo that's (laughs) trying all these 
new things. You know, I'm, I'm really only trying things that are already exist in other industries, but it is like things are changing rapidly. Mm-hmm. Like we are definitely in that hockey stick of, yep. you know, computing and the internet and everything and, and changing. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I have, there's uh, a phrase that's been sticking in my head uh, since I heard it uh, this summer and, you know, it came from a, uh, this guy, Hymet, who's our CEO of the National Public Outlets Organization, which we you know, operate on local side of. And as they've been doing their own strategic planning, he says, the next 10 years will disproportionately affect the next one. Yes. And so we have to be really conscientious of what we do at that time. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. That's a really good way to look at things because it is like this. We're at like these weird precipice mm-hmm. moments, right? It's like, is Bitcoin going to be the next right. base layer of all transactions? Like, who knows, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're in that era where it was like the internet was a fad mm-hmm. and now it's here. What's next for us is super interesting. Nonprofit innovation is hard though because there is always that that sort of like tension between the people who want to try things and the back office staff mm-hmm. or dealing with what you said to me was dealing with the nonprofit industrial complex. Yeah. Um, and I know that you teach a course at our local MCTC. At MCTC, yeah. Yeah, which is the Minneapolis Community Technical College. Mm -hmm. When we first met, we were talking about balancing our mission-driven work with building the right infrastructure. And it seems like that was also trying to innovate. That's a lot to chew on for Mm -hmm. nonprofits. Yeah, so the, the course I teach is called Leadership in the Politics of Community Change. We named it that because as you lead these organizations, you also have to manage a certain level of politics around it and there's a lot of both systems navigation but also just kind of interpersonal community navigation that happen um, and especially in a city like Minneapolis where it's sizable but it also can sometimes feel like a big small town oh, yeah. uh, where everybody oh, knows totally. each other things can be very turfy uh, mm-hmm. you know especially when it comes to like funding or neighborhood strategies you know you really need to know I think who the players are and so a lot of that conversation uh, is embedded in the class. The kind of duality of it is, you know, how do you hold intention these two things at the same time where you need to have solid infrastructure, finance, business operations, but then also at the same time, not lose your soul uh, and think about, you know, how are we staying true to our mission and being responsive to the communities that we purport to serve? Say more about that, about the how do you not lose your soul? Mm-hmm. Like, how does one lose their soul? I mean, I think, in, and this is like, you know, kind of what I was saying before around kind of some of our long-term sister agencies where they had gotten really good at business side of it. But if you're not staying relevant, then you're not going to have a client base. Or if you're thinking about the work solely from like, I need to have a client base versus there's a certain level of change that we're shooting for. It's not going to last for people very long. The thing that pops into my head is the idea around you should be trying to work yourself mm-hmm. out of business. And not by becoming irrelevant, right. but by actually accomplishing your mission. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, some missions are just, like, ridiculously hard and right. take forever to accomplish. Right. But I think there's this thing that, that happens where organizations get into sort of mission delivery programmatic rut, where it's mm-hmm. like you're putting the same Band-Aid on the same wound over and over again, and, and you don't want to really change that because people might you might not qualify for that grant anymore, or people mm-hmm. might not give to you anymore, or it might be really risky, and so... There's almost like a mentality that comes up, and I think that's maybe where you're getting at, like how you lose your soul, is where you've actually focused so much on keeping the operations going. And what's interesting to me about that is like, I do think there is this mentality, this like culture of poverty in Mm -hmm. the nonprofit sector where we are simultaneously encouraged to appear poor because if you have too much money and your marketing and fundraising efforts are too fancy, that's bad. But also we're all terrified of losing what we have. There's a scarcity mindset in the way that can set in. So it's cool to me that your organization has been very willing to fail repeatedly in order to try things. Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's a it's a fun place to work. I mean, you know, when we were talking before, I mean, I've tried a number of things and some have been really successful and some have totally fallen on their face. Are you willing to share one or two examples of like things that tried and didn't work or th- something that did work? Yeah, I mean, I think, in, and sometimes things work for a period of time, and, and then they don't work anymore. We had an interpreting agency, and so when I first took it over, it was pretty broken. I think we had, I don't know, six or seven staff in there, 
which is bleeding money. But we thought that it could it could grow into something different because for us at the time, the idea was that like you know we were providing training to people who were themselves were non native English speakers as a way to gain income, but then also place them in a clinical setting where they were providing interpreting services so other immigrant communities could get access to quality health. So we did a lot of work revamping it. We quickly grew to probably about 18 staff and to a place where we were actually producing a significant surplus for the, the broader organization. And it's because it was all fee for service. We could use that almost kind of like our innovation money to try to do other sorts of things. That's awesome. Or provide better training or whatever it may be. And, you know, over time and, you know, and that went on for a few years, but with like county rates, you know, not increasing with costs, you know, it just became increasingly unsustainable. And so then we had to come to a realization that in this format, we couldn't really continue it. So we ended up finding a better way where, you know, the, the main clinical partner that we had, we worked out kind of a ramp down where we would no longer be the provider but then slowly they would end up hiring those interpreters as their own staff. It ended up becoming kind of a win-win because yeah, I'm like that... this doesn't sound like a failure, Antonio. <laughs> but I don't know. but it, but it was a failure in the sense of the 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 business model no longer worked for us. So you know we had to then pivot. You know, there's always external circumstances that you can't control. So what's um, what's one of the things that the organization has, you know, really took a gamble on or required some really out-of-the-box approach? Well, I mean, I think the if I'm using kind of my area as an example, as an authorizer, that can be a very dry, boring <laughs> topic and job. Charter school yeah. authorizer. Right. Evaluation. Yeah. Department of Ed compliance, right? It can be a very unsexy thing to talk about. The space that we come from, though, is in having the work rooted in the frame of the mission of PUC. And so, you know, before then it was this kind of creating choice, change and connection, and now it's shifted to, you know, we're, you know, community builders, co-creating change for an enduring just society, you know, or something very close mm-hmm. to that. And so we take that pretty seriously. Uh, and that the fa- the face of the work has to be one where you center community and what they're looking for. And so, you know, we describe ourselves as a, a high touch community based office. That means we've had to build out these kind of, I call them kind of these authorizer plus activities. And so we offer a higher level of professional development, technical assistance. We do a lot of convenings. We've, you know, done these kind of learning journeys alongside the Bush Foundation where we take people to, you know, other high performing charter and district public schools across the country so they can learn from it. Right. And so we build community in a different way. Um, that amplifies the work and elevates it from space of just, okay, did you submit your stuff to the state on time? And if you didn't, I'm going to send you this like nasty gram. Right. And so. Well, it's almost like your organization becomes more of a strategic partner. It's yeah. like, hey, like, yeah, we're going to hold you to the rules, but also we're going to support you and empower you to be the best charter school that you can be. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Well, in the way that I artic- I've articulated this to people a lot, you know, you have the state statute that says this is what you do, right? Um, and I've always been really intentional that we shouldn't look at statute as the box we live in, but the foundation on which we build. Right on. Well, thank you so much for being Absolutely. here. This was awesome. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right, folks, that's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks, this podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice. 